Comparison Grounds, a monthly game club where we play games and brew good conversation together. My name is Jenny Windham. And I'm Joel Thomas. And it is the first episode of 2024. Oh, I'm so excited. <laughs> happiest of New Year's to you, Jenny. Happy New Year to you too, Joel. And Happy New Year to everyone listening. Uh, if this is your first time joining, Geeks and Grounds is kind of like a book club, but for video games. We take a game, play it all month together, talk about it, really dig in deep. And um, on top of that, we like to discuss other media, things that we're enjoying, things about the game industry. But at the heart and soul of Geeks and Grounds, we are a video game book club. <laughs> yes. the the at, at this point, after a full year, the longest tenure for Joel of any book club I've ever been a part of. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I feel like we need some sort of fanfare or like something big in the background. Um, I think this is actually the longest tenure of any book club I've been in as well that I've not been a teacher for. I'm not going to count this as Okay, that's a good clarifying statement, yes, that I've not been a teacher for. I was mandated to be a part of my students' book clubs, essentially, because it was part of the curriculum. Uh, Still enjoyed it, but this is my first fun book club for for me, you know? With with adults, mostly adults, adults. I would say. Yeah. (laughs) Oh my gosh. Um, So 2024, big year, I feel like for Geeks and Grounds in general, this is our second year. So I feel like we've gotten our feet under us. There's Mm -hmm. little, little bits of improvements and things that I want to like judge up as we move into our second year. But um, yeah, just really excited to start our, our first game of the year. Uh, But before we talk about that game, that the first monthly brew of 2024. Let's uh, jump over to the pastry case for this episode's sort of topic of the day, topic of the week, uh, topic Topic of the the year, literally topic of the year at this point in time, uh, our most anticipated games of 2024. We closed out last year talking about some of our favorites, the charcuterie board, (laughs) Geeks and Crowns (laughs) charcuterie board. Um, What are you most looking forward to this year, Joel? I am uh, I'm a bit of a basic bitch when it comes to <laughs> games that I, that I look forward to. Um, but, you know, uh, as a defender of the basic, I think that's all right. Um, I only have a few that are like very strongly on my radar. Um, mm-hmm. You mentioned in our last episode that the new Final Fantasy seven uh, uh, rebirth is coming out in February. Uh, around my birthday. I'm very (laughs) excited for that. Um, I did not even know to be excited for it. And then as we were kind of looking at games for the year, uh, that definitely pinged hard. (laughs) Um, I want to say, didn't we, I think we played the, the Yuffie DLC from the last rebirth together. Yeah. I came over to your house and we like did it in one shot. That was so cool. (laughs) We should try to do something like that again. That was like, it felt like, like being in college again and you're like hanging out with your roommates playing a game, you know? So good. Although playing the entire the entirety of a of a FF seven might be, I was going to say playing all of Rebirth maybe a little bit longer than just a one night hangout. <laughs> might have to camp for a little bit. Yeah, absolutely. Um, that, that might be a bit frustrating. Uh, so maybe not in person, <laughs> but we can definitely chart each other's progress uh, yes. as we start game journal. As we got our game year. journals going. Yep, exactly. Yes. Ready for that. Um, the other one is a demo that I played over the summer during Steam Fest, Steam Next Fest, Steam mm-hmm. Demo days. Um, <laughs> it was uh, Nine Souls. And yeah. um, I literally find myself checking the Steam page for this at least once a month just to see if it happened to drop early. And uh, it's just like, I i love a side-scrolling platformer but i haven't found one since like celeste that like Mm -hmm. really scratched the itch Mm -hmm. and the fact that this combines side-scrolling platformers with one of my favorite video game elements which is like waiting to be attacked encountering it's like my favorite thing so the demo was who are you (laughs) you like to parry oh my god in in like hard games I can't do it. So like Elden Ring, Dark Souls. (laughs) You are a Souls guy, though. You're like a Souls like fan, I feel like. (laughs) Yes, I am a fan, but I'm not I never got good. I am like the I'm like a cheese bro. Like, give me all the magic. (laughs) Let me stand from far away. Let me let me zap the baddies. Um, But this is like it reminds me of like 
uh, counters and parries in like the Assassin's Creed games or like mm-hmm. the Arkham mm-hmm. City games where it's like you just need to like have one button ready to press and like you can kind of hold your pose. It, it seems like at least in the demo, it was a really like accessible way for people like me who, who never got good um, <laughs> to enjoy the countering. And it's the primary mechanic for this game. So like yeah. a little bit different. Um, the art style was really cool. The, the main character is like this white fox dog looking <laughs> guy with a sword and that does like little mm-hmm. jutsus like in naruto i don't know like it just it's so cool and i'm just, <laughs> i'm i'm pumped for this to come out mm-hmm. um you mentioned souls games yes. um number three on my list is the elden ring dlc i saw Ooh. an announcement for that uh actually earlier today mm-hmm. um <laughs> word is it's all going to be in the death blight swamps which um is perhaps the most awful experience in the game but you know we'll see <laughs> um there's rumors of switch 2 this year uh this is not a game obviously but like something that i'm excited for uh as a as a nintendo boy yeah Uh, and i learned something this week uh that has it's not it's not coming out this year but it's something i will definitely be making time for this year i did not know that the alan wake series takes place in the same universe as the control series i just learned that this week and Control was one of my favorite games like two or three years ago, whenever it was that it got really mm-hmm. big. I I loved everything about it, the aesthetic, the gameplay, the spookiness. And so now that I know that Alan Wake is in this universe, like I've got to get into this, into these games. I had no idea. Yeah. Well, I mean, and it's like the perfect time to get into Alan Wake right now because Alan Wake 2 just came out. So yeah. I mean, it's like perfect. Yes. So I'm I'm actually super excited. I think that so it's like five my top five things I'm looking forward to video game wise for Ooh. 2024. Uh how about you? What are what are you looking forward to? Um a couple of repeats from what you have as well. I think the my number one uh most basic <laughs> but honestly most anticipated thing for this year is Final Fantasy VII Rebirth. I am such a Final Fantasy fan and Final Fantasy VII as many other folks also have the special place in their heart. I do too for this game. Uh, and I cannot wait. The theory crafting and just the the anticipation of playing something that you know that you grew up with and you love with that nostalgic feeling, but knowing that they're going to potentially change it up in some drastic ways is mm-hmm. really exciting. And I know some folks aren't necessarily fans of it. I love it. I'm, I say we have the original play with the remake like go go do what you'd like with it i want to see what you you would envision for it now um you know to the creators i think that's so cool are there any elements i guess like as spoiler free as you can answer this question i'm mm-hmm. curious to see. are there any elements of the original that you would be disappointed if it didn't carry through or at least get a reimagining in some way in the new game um I think on a very sort of smaller level, I love, love, love the Golden Saucer and Ferris Wheel Ride, and specifically the Ferris Wheel Ride that you take, where you can have actually the ride happen with any member of your party at that point, um, based on sort of this invisible relationship point system they had in the original. Um, I'm hoping they keep it, and I'm hoping, I would love for it to still be um, based on your interactions with characters in the game different for each character, like a different date, essentially. But I don't know if they're going to keep that. Um, Yeah, we'll see if that happens. But um, I would love for it to still have that, like, excitement of, ooh, am I going to get this person or am I going to get this other person based on sort of... I think in the original is based on how often you battled with them in your party. If you put them oh. directly next to you, did you heal them frequently or did you let them like get KO'd and leave them on the battlefield? Um, <laughs> like all of those things were taken into account into the system. So as well as some like dialogue stuff that happened. Um, and it was very heavily weighted towards, you know, like Ares and Tifa and even Barrett, like some of your early party members, but uh, still having that little, like, ooh, this is a thing I can change uh, was so fun. So that's such a small detail, but um, I would love for them to keep that. Obviously, the big question on everyone's minds is whether or not a very specific character ends up making it through the game alive. 
And I'm honestly, I could go either way if I want mm-hmm. them to stay true to it or not. On a different day, I will have a different answer because it's just, I could see it go being super impactful to stay the same. I could see it being super impactful to change it up. So I, I actually am very just excited to see what they do with that. That's rad. Do you know, I, I just don't know this. It, is this going to be the final installment of the FF7 remakes or is there going to be another one after this? There will be one more after this, <sighs> if I'm remembering correctly. I know. So it's like, <laughs> we're going to, it's like, how old will we be when this is complete? I don't know. Um, but <laughs> <laughs> like so many things, like Brandon Sanderson is writing a series right now. And I'm just like, I think I probably won't live to see the end. <laughs> like, the rate that it's going um because it's on yeah. book four or five and they're supposed to be 12 and it's taken how many years um so i think we'll probably actually final fantasy will probably more likely see the end of that uh especially since they're using the same engine i imagine things are moving more quickly mm. but um yeah i'm just i'm just so stoked for it um my second selection is this charming farming sim called Fields of Mystria. Uh, I have been looking forward to this game for many years. Um, it's just one of my most, like, it was up there with Coral Island as one of my most anticipated farming sims. And Coral Island has taken priority because it came out, you know, this last year and it's been an early access. Now that Coral Island's out, I've been playing it to my heart's content. Mm-hmm. I can put my intention towards anticipating more fully Fields of Mystria. Um, what I love the most is that it's got a sort of 90s like mid nineties pixel art SNES aesthetic, Mm. um, almost like the original sort of SNES harvest moon games, but the cutscenes and some of the character profile art looks like nineties anime characters. So it's mixing these two aesthetics that I love very much. Um, it doesn't hurt that all the characters are very hot. So it's like, (laughs) There's that. If you are, I love romance in games. I love wooing and dating in games. And this has that in spades, but it also just has a great, what looks to be a great um, interpretation and like sort of modern take on a lot of classic farming sim sim mechanics. So I'm just stoked. It looks beautiful to me. Yeah. I, I've clicked on the link and like mm-hmm. the opening image for this game is this like bad boy redhead with a bandana oh yeah and like (laughs) shirt sleeves rolled up to show his biceps and i was like oh yeah a new like cosplay opportunity for redheads here we go yes oh my gosh do it and then i like click through the images and apparently there's like this guy's name is march apparently and Mm -hmm. (laughs) the dialogue box is the name's march dot 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 what do you want? <laughs> I love me I a surly love 90s character. Oh my gosh, me too. I'm like, give me sullen, <laughs> abrasive, not wanting to get to know you. God, it's so good. <laughs> um, yeah, all the characters are super cute. And I'm very, very excited for this one. Um, and then the other game that you also mentioned already, so I won't spend too much time on it, uh, Nine Souls looks incredible. I love that it's got this beautiful 2D art with this dark twist to it too. Like Mm -hmm. it's going to be a dark game. Um, It's by the team, if I'm remembering correctly, that also made Detention, that also made, um, oh God, Red Candle Studios. I'm trying to remember their other title and it's going to drive me wild. So I'm going to look it up really fast. Um, (laughs) It's interesting because like the the design of the world is very much like high like east asian high fantasy meets like yes technology like almost like metroid level technology like as you're making your way yeah. through the levels so it's it's a really interesting hybrid it is it's it's so cool and uh it, it's red candle games and they made detention um in 2017 and devotion in 2019 and devotion actually had um it was taken off of the steam store for a while i don't know if it's back but i think it's only sold through their official site because um they're from taiwan and there was i guess like upset with the tiny taiwanese mm. government because of some imagery that they put in that the government didn't approve of so oh, interesting yeah so they're they're just like a really really good studio especially if you like horror so i'm excited to see this horror team take on a very mechanically you know like you said platforming parrying driven game um and then the last two i'll also go really quick uh citizen sleeper 2 i don't know if this is coming out in 2024 it just says coming soon so i'm hoping we're getting a 2024 (laughs) release 
But Citizen Sleeper 2 is the sequel to Citizen Sleeper. Uh, and Citizen Sleeper is a game that we're going to be playing this year for Geeks and Grounds. Um, it is an outstanding narrative RPG. One of just like up there for me with Disco Elysium and some other titles, like like just really outstanding wow. with what they do. Um, it's stylish and cool, and I'm excited to see how they continue to expand the world and what they what they do with it. Um, and so, yeah, just excited uh, for Citizen Sleeper Two. Quick shout out, uh, mm-hmm. Citizen Sleeper one as of today is 40 percent off on steam so oh heck yeah to get a deal <laughs> yeah it is um what you call it the steam holiday winter sale i think until mm, january yeah, yeah. 4th um and i think this episode will come out on the second so if you're listening to this right when we come out you have two days you can pick it up it's a good game and we're going to be <laughs> playing it on geeks and grounds so might as well pick it up on sale right Um, And then the last title that I will mention on the podcast, there's so many, God, there's so many games um, I'm looking forward to, but Earthblade, which you mentioned Celeste earlier, Joel, this is actually from the team that made Celeste uh, Extremely Okay Games, and it just looks stunning. Um, It's sort of this action platformer exploration game, pixel art. It looks like it's going to have a lot of the similar sort of level design in that you have these platforms that you're jumping across and having to navigate. Um, But I'm honestly not quite sure what the story is. It just looks mm-hmm. beautiful to me, it and I'm very, beautiful. very excited. Um, it just says, travel the remnants of a ruined world, encounter denizens, both friend and foe, and piece together the Earth's fractured history. So I'm just excited what ways they will devise to both like give me hope in the world and also like break my heart, because Celeste did both for me, and <laughs> I just can't wait to see what they do. And this is, yeah, Earthblade. What's that Jenny is excited about a game where you're exploring ruins and trying to uncover what happened to a society? I can't imagine Oh my that. gosh. Yeah, what? <laughs> it's not like any other game we've ever played or will play. <laughs> no, that looks absolutely stunning. Like the, the greenery and foliage kind of mm-hmm. overtaking the world. That's one of my favorite designs and they have absolutely crushed it. So yeah, yes. it looks really cool. Yeah, and they have a really interesting mix of like, there's one screenshot or part in the trailer where there's like stained glass in mixed with the foliage. And so there's this like really cool juxtaposition of some elements of civilization with with elements of more of like wilderness, you know, mm-hmm. very cool. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Um, there are a few other titles. I will put both Joel and my lists in the newsletter, link them in the show notes somewhere that you all can access them. If you want to take a look at these pages and wish list them as well. Uh, but yeah, it's going to be, it's going to be a nice, a nice year for games, I think. Yeah, I'm excited. I mean, honestly, like the fact that we don't have so many, like, at least that I'm aware of like yeah. massive AAA, like yeah, hundred hour plus long games on the list is kind of um, a good thing. I need to catch up. (laughs) So uh... yeah, it was interesting as I was going through, like a few of these immediately came to mind. Um, I'm excited about them, but I felt like my list had been, was shorter this Mm. year than maybe previous years. And it felt okay. Like I was worried that I'd be disappointed. I'm like, (laughs) oh, I can't think of anything. Like, should I think of more? I was like, I actually feel very okay. Not anticipating or like really, having a chock full list of games that i need to play soon because i've got plenty (laughs) that i need to finish we have smart goals for this year because they're achievable realistic and timely (laughs) exactly (laughs) um so rad aside from anticipating games um anything you've been playing watching reading listening that you want to share about well, let me just uh, give a quick plug uh, for Christmas. Uh, my partner got me the Akira box set, the like <gasps> the collector's Ooh. edition, whatever. It is massive and beautiful. And I've just about finished the first collected volume of six. Um, wow. And I-, I am just like, I've always loved the movie. I've only read like the first half of like 30 pages of the manga. So I'm very right. excited to be digging into it. And it's just like, absolutely incredible the uh the detail with which the artists were able to to come together and and create these cityscapes um i had a really fun night over the holidays uh with my my siblings 
uh, watching the Taylor Swift Eras Tour, uh, the extended <laughs> edition uh, together. We all got together. We were singing along. And, Cute. Um, oh, I love that. My my partner's mom was there and she started off like, I've never heard of Taylor Swift. I've never listened to a single song, which is if you know my if you know my wife, Lee, she is a huge Swifty. <laughs> so um, it was like, yes, you have. We've listened to it together, <laughs> yada, yada. And it was just like one of those moments of like endless discovery where like every song like she would shout out like, oh, this is fun. And I really like this or oh, yeah. I do know this song, or whatever. So cute. it's just some cute memories. Mm-hmm. Um, and actually, I have not watched it yet, but I'm going to this week. The live action Spirited Away uh, <gasps> play performance uh, hit HBO <gasps> this last week. So uh, there are two versions with two different lead actresses playing uh, Jahiro. Is that her name? Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm so excited. I've been wanting to see this for years since it first got announced. And the fact that we're going to watch it on demand, I'm like, I'm very, very excited for this. I'm so happy you mentioned this because I did not know. And I'm also like, I had a friend who saw the theater show, like the play in person and she said it was the most beautiful thing she's ever seen uh and ever since then i was like man i don't think i'll ever get a chance to see it even on like theaters and wow so i'm very happy you mentioned this yep (laughs) if you all are looking for something to do in the first week of your new year pop in and uh we can maybe chat about it in the discord yeah oh my gosh well i'm curious tell us about what you're into then uh, well, I was going to ask, uh, is Spirited Away your favorite Miyazaki, like, work? Or would you say, because, like, I'm curious just in the in the rankings of Miyazaki, if if it's up there, if you have a different maybe favorite. Spirited Away is definitely in the tops. Like, I have a hard time ranking them. I think for me, like, Howl, Spirited Away, Nausicaa, mm-hmm. Mononoke, and now I'll, I'll even add um, the boy and the heron. Mm-hmm. they're all like i can't choose between them which one i like more or less i think some of them are maybe paced a bit better than the others yeah but i i just i love them like i could just sit down and watch and rewatch all of them so yeah i'm i'm mm-hmm. so excited for this one. Oh, that's so cool how about you do you have an, what are your do you have some tops um, nope <laughs> uh, to be <laughs> very honest uh i haven't been really reading or listening or doing too much of anything other than um getting everything like if you're watching on youtube you can see like the cat kennel is gone so i've been just been kind of cleaning out my office area and um i uh, mostly have just been replaying undertale <laughs> for mm-hmm. my annual is sort of ho- winter holiday replay um undertale is a game i play every year um just because it's one of my favorite in the game you see like a Christmas tree <laughs> basically there's and there's a village called Snowden so it's like very holiday-esque to me and so it's my annual holiday game um I haven't beaten it quite yet I'll probably beat it tonight um for I don't know even how many times it's been because it's been maybe four or five years this has the tra- been the tradition I think um it doesn't mean I'm good I <laughs> astound at myself at how bad I am still at the bullet hell elements of undertale i'm so bad but and i never remember any of the attacks or any of the orders of things that happen but i have a blast every time uh so So, yeah i was gonna ask so i have two questions about your undertale playthrough oh yeah question one are you trying to go with like the non-violent route are you setting any goals like that for yourself or are you just kind of working through it however you work through it this time i have only played the pacifist route ever There have been a handful of times I start and I'm like, maybe this is the time I'll try to do a neutral (laughs) or like the murder run where I try to kill everyone, see what it's like to go fully dark. And then I get to, there's a battle that you have with um, this character named Toriel. And every time that battle starts, I'm like, nope, sorry, I cannot. I I won't ever do it. I'll just watch the other runs and other endings uh, on YouTube. (laughs) is oh that's so interesting so you've never broken bat for the uninitiated do would you Mm -hmm. care to explain to people like who've never played undertale like the difference and like why the pacifist run is like significant yeah so with undertale um there is sort of this element of player choice and how you want to interact with the world uh as a player you can choose to in every battle act and interact with each of the your opponents or like the monsters that you encounter and spare them using this 
thing called mercy, or you can go a more traditional RPG route and defeat them and get gain levels and get stronger. Um, if you, there are three essentially different major endings to Undertale, depending on what path you take. Um, whether you go full pacifist and you spare everyone and you do a couple other things to get like the full true pacifist run, um, you can do a mix. Maybe you defeat some enemies, but you spare others. That's more neutral. Um, and then you have what people have colloquially called like, um, like the murder run or like, I forget. Yeah. Basically they, they say you just kill everything, uh, in this run. I've never done that personally just cause I don't know. I think I've become attached to these characters in a way where I'm like, even though I know they're fictional, I don't want to do that to them. Mm -hmm. I don't know. Yeah. It's just this interesting feeling that I have where I'm like, uh, I, I just don't want to, if I'm spending time in this world, I want it to be time that I enjoy. And I enjoy oh. seeing these characters happy and like fulfilled and getting to know them versus, you know, I've seen on YouTube, some of the the runs where it's like, they're afraid of you and they interact very differently with you. And mm. so, um, yeah. So yeah, that's, that's really just, beautiful. Yeah. Uh, I, yeah. And it makes sense, especially cause you've played it so many times. I, so I guess here's my second question then. Uh, again, for those who don't know, like when you are engaging in like a battle, you have kind of unorthodox options for how you're going to engage. Right. Um, like if a if the monster you're fighting is like really sad, you can say things to it as, as a right. way to like either make it more sad or make it less sad or or whatever. Mm -hmm. um, one of the things that I struggled with when I played through, and I ne just kind of needed to go to the guide the whole time, yeah, is I I couldn't pick up the logic between like there were a lot of times where it's like I don't understand why this particular like dialogue option is effective for this adversary. Mm. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I never quite put the pieces together to understand like, oh yeah, this makes sense because of X, Y, or Z. Yeah. Is that something, have you been able to like put your finger on the pulse of that at all? Like, can you kind of understand mm -hmm. the logic behind that? I feel like I can, but I think it's also a mix. I've played it, I've played it enough where I think maybe at this point, even though I have a really bad memory and I never quite remember exactly what it is, I can kind of, I feel like I can get the sense of like, oh, I'm pretty sure it's this. Um, but what I found interesting was with with all of the creatures that you encounter, um, like you said, there is dialogue that that um, gives you clues. And, and usually with the clues, it, it's either one of two ways, which just sounds obvious when you say it out loud, but it's either very overt, like, oh, this is a sad creature. Um, they want you to, like, console them. Or sometimes it's like, less overt like it's a sad creature but in consoling them they're like you don't know me <laughs> why are you consoling right, me? right and so i think there's an element because you see each creature usually at least two or three times in an area um i think battles ugh, see and i'm like i played this for so many years and i don't even know because i've never looked it up i think battles are finite i think you go mm -hmm. through an area and you don't necessarily like I think if you really wanted to grind, you could, but I don't think the area pushes like a ton of battles on you intentionally, yeah. like a traditional RPG. And so after about one or two, you kind of get to know these creatures, which is what I found fascinating because mm. it's like, it's like getting to know people, right? Some people, if you joke with them, they'll immediately joke back and they're fine. But some people you have to like get to know them first and then they'll do a joke. And so mm. you kind of like some of that trial and error is built in in a way that I think feels very good. Um, and yeah, you just kind of learn as you play, like how you would get to know a person. So I, I felt like oh. I had the pulse on it, but I still had trial and error mo moments, you know? I would love to get like the Jenny Wyndham blogosphere spot <laughs> of like, <laughs> your experience playing through undertale some year where it's like one of your annual playthroughs and you're just like taking notes and then synthesizing like oh, what man. is the experience for you what does it mean why yeah. is it so impactful like i i don't think i'm the only one who would be really interested to understand like or, or just to learn more about your engagement with it yeah i i love the game and it's interesting because i think the fandom 
is the fandom is super passionate sometimes in ways that I think even puts me off of the game a little bit. Like I, <laughs> I sometimes hesitate and I'm like, I don't want to be like, I'm an Undertale fan because I think it holds certain oh, no. connotations in some spaces. Um, mm. But I am a huge fan of the game. I think it's absolutely wonderful. So yeah, maybe someday when I have a little bit of spare time <laughs> or maybe as I play uh, next year, I can I can go through it. Or we could go through it together because I would honestly love to play it alongside other people who maybe are not playing it the same way I am because I think that would be super fulfilling. I I would be willing to play a, a villain run alongside oh your pure pacifist run. <laughs> uh, I've I also have not I've only done the pacifist run, so I I would be I'm I'm curious uh, yeah. to see what it would be like. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, that's just, I haven't been engaging with anything new, just going back to old favorites this this week. I think you've earned a bit of comfort. Uh, I think so too. <laughs> the season it's for been comforts a, and been joy. It's been a long end of 23, 2023, mm-hmm. I feel like. So into 2024, keep, keep it light a little bit. Mm-hmm. Keep it light, absolutely. Yes. Uh, just to finish out the pastry case, uh, for notable releases this week, this just came out, um, or no, yes, today, actually, as of this episode releasing for you publicly, uh, it's called The Night is Gray. Um, I guess a few days, it'll come out a little later, actually. No, I'm getting my dates wrong. This is coming out January 4th. Either way, whenever this episode comes out. Um, this oh looks God. really interesting. Um, <laughs> did you just bring up the steam page yes okay um it's a it's a beautiful point and click adventure um i don't really know a ton about it other than i saw it on twitter and it was just it caught my eye um it's about this man named graham who is fleeing for his life uh he picks up and finds this young girl and so they're trying to get their way to safety I love a good like grumpy I don't know if he's grumpy but it gives off the like grumpy guy Mm -hmm. with the charming young girl vibe I'm that's a trope that I love Love that trope so um I'm I'm here for it and it looks very very interesting um and it's by whale stork interactive and there's a demo out if y'all wanted to give it a shot before picking it up yeah I looked on the steam and the first image you see is the girl sitting on a chair in front of a fireplace with a shotgun pointed at the guy (laughs) Mm-hmm. He's like holding his hands up. It's like the little girl looks like she's like, I don't know, five, maybe something yeah, like that. Very, very young. Yeah. <laughs> it's like, oh no, what's happening? <laughs> so yeah, it looks intense. I think um I think any fans of I don't know if it's post-apocalyptic, but it feels very like Last of Us vibes almost mm-hmm. in, in mm-hmm. point and click side scrolling form. Um very yeah, and that is it for the pastry case. So if you would like to share any of your thoughts, anything that you would interested in um, from this part of the discussion, feel free to send an email to Jenny at Geeks and Grounds, or we have a new option. Uh, you can leave a voicemail at sayhi.chat slash Geeks and Grounds. Uh, this is this program called Telby. I found it and it looks really cool. So I'm giving it a try. Um, basically, all you need is your computer or your phone and a microphone. And you can just leave us a voicemail and we can just pop that into an episode in the future if you would like. So feel free and share your thoughts with us that way too. Uh, and one one quick point of clarification. You don't have to have a separate microphone. You can use whatever yeah. microphone is built into your device. Yes, yes. Um, yeah. All right. So this month's brew... We uh, were kicking it off this year with a game that I'm very, very sentimental about because it actually holds a little bit of place in in Geeks and Grounds history. Uh, This is the game that with the community members, uh, Thespia Manser and Ghostly, I prototyped (laughs) some of the initial framework of Geeks and Grounds with um, a couple years ago. So this holds a little bit of a sentimental value for me, but we are going to be playing a little game called One Shot. One Shot. Yeah. Had you heard of it before uh, Before playing, Joel? I had seen the creature, like the main character. Yeah. Um, at maybe like cons and stuff. And I just never knew what it was. And so when I clicked on the game page for the first time, I was like, oh, this is the game with that creature person that I've seen <laughs> everywhere. I had no idea. So I... 
I went in completely green to this. I didn't know anything. I had no expectations. Um, so yeah, no, it's was, it was totally fresh for me. Yeah. Oh, really? Interesting. I love that you mentioned you'd seen this character around. I had never before, and I still haven't. And I'm like, I wish I've seen a one shot something <laughs> at a convention. Um, this game is a little bit older. It came out in December of 2016 originally. Um, and the Steam summary, just for folks who maybe haven't gotten a chance to hop in yet, is One Shot is a surreal top-down puzzle adventure game with unique gameplay capabilities. You are to guide a child through a mysterious world on a mission to restore its long-dead son. The world knows you exist. Not <sighs> ominous at all. <laughs> um, so this is the game that we'll be playing. I... I think this is um, this is a really interesting game, uh, kind of like to the moon for me, because I feel like there are some really strong elements to this game and some elements that probably as a community will divide people. Uh, and I think that's really exciting because that will, I think, lead to some interesting conversation. Um, but the big thing is I wanted to make sure if you hadn't had a chance to check out the playthrough guide, that's where we go into where you can find it. Um, any content warnings uh, just as a heads up there aren't really any major content warnings for this one um, the developer themselves did put the sentence that this is not a horror game in the traditional sense but parts of the game may induce some paranoia so just be mm. cautious <laughs> um, uh, alluding to some of these fourth wall breaking moments I think and so just go in look at the steam page if you haven't started it yet um, just so that you go in fully fully aware but for this week, for this week, we are going to be talking about the first two sections of the game, the beginning and what is it called? The Barons. The Barons. So if you are wanting to wait, this is your time. We're going full spoiler into the first part of the game um, and we're going to delve deep within it. So if you need to pause and come back yes. later. <laughs> or, or don't and like let us spoil some things for you oh, yeah. get a little get a little taste on your tongue before That's you hop true. in it's kind of oh. like playing with cliff's notes right because it's like then you're primed to really look for certain things maybe go even deeper than we are oh, wouldn't that be something uh yeah. turn i mean it, generally the community is always able to go deeper than we yes. do so uh <laughs> which oh, we yes. appreciate that's what we like um yeah so we kick off um yeah, and you you've played this before. Yes. Were there any like big um, themes or elements of the game that you were really looking forward to hitting on as we hopped into this game? Yes, I think there there are so many. As in any good media, there's going to be a ton of things you could really take mm -hmm. away with. The things that really resonated with me that I'm looking forward to diving back into is really the theme of like love and letting go. I think, I think this game, especially when we talk about love of fictions and love mm. of fictional characters, I think this game really got me thinking in a way that honestly, very few games have for as long as this, like this game has stuck with wow. me for a while. Um, and this idea of what does it mean to let go? Uh, and we'll be talking about that throughout the entirety of this game. Um, but I think also there are other elements about consciousness, about what does it mean to be sentient um, that that we'll talk about as well on, on sort of a lighter scale too, which is pretty cool. That is very cool. It's interesting because uh, the word that I, I was anchoring on after this opening element was acceptance. Um, mm. Which I, I can't remember what phrase you just used, but it, it seemed like a very parallel, um, a, a parallel theme to one of the ones that you just mentioned. And I can't remember what, you, what it was anymore. <laughs> uh, so yeah, I, I, I think there's, it seems like even already, I've only, it's about an hour to get through this first mm -hmm. uh, section that we played. Yeah. And it's like, they have, they have planted some seeds. So I'm excited yes. to, to dig in and, and harvest the what grows. <laughs> yeah. So at the very beginning, you start in, a room <laughs> with the cat. Uh, I think what's kind of interesting is on the Switch compared to, I don't know if Steam does this because I'm playing this on the Switch right now. And actually we should be clear about where we're playing this because I think there's going to be some slight differences depending on where folks play this. Um, minor, not story differences, but just in how we may experience it. Uh, on the Switch, you do get this like 
OS screen, like you're booting up an OS and mm-hmm. then like the world machine sort of screen comes up and then you you learn how to click on this fake desktop on your Switch and then the game starts. Um, I cannot remember if the Steam version does that or if the Itch version does that. Let, let us know, um, you know, in any of the avenues where you can chat with us. Uh, if that's the case, uh, I would love to hear that from you all. But- yeah, and it, the, that operating system looks like 1990s yeah. Mac, like you're in the school computer lab. Well, I know we have a younger audience, so yeah. <laughs> maybe you don't know what a computer lab is. Um, but yeah, we had like a computer lab. We go and play Oregon Trail or Number Crunchers. And the, the desktop that I mm-hmm. saw growing up is the desktop that you see. I, I'm also playing it on Switch. Yeah. Uh, as like you click it to start the game, you you begin on this kind of desktop experience. That was so trippy for me. I yeah. was like... Oh, this is this does not look like this really cool cat character that I've seen. What's going on? So like yeah. immediately I'm like, okay, my expectations have immediately been subverted and mm-hmm. I'm in for something different than I was expecting. So yes. Um, yeah. So like I thought that was a really um an immediate way to say, like, hey, there's more going on here than just like a puzzle, a puzzle game. Yep. Yeah. And I I thought that was super effective too. Because again, the first time I played it was on PC. And I think some of the things that weren't as clear to me um, because of how they structured this beginning on Switch became much more like very immediately clear. Like you said, your expectations immediately are set in a very different way than Mm. perhaps if you had just seen the store page and hopped in. Um, I'm curious then when you started the game and you booted up one shot, on this OS. Um, What were some of your initial reactions or experiences like? Um, Well, here's like just a bit of a meta commentary. My first feeling was relief because I had purchased the game on my Steam Deck and it would not launch. And so then I had to buy it on (laughs) Switch so that I could play the game. And I was like, okay, good. It's working. Um, I I had an immediate feeling of um, concern, I think, to be honest, because I was like, oh, man, you have to use like the right joystick and right trigger on the switch mm-hmm. to like click on things on the desktop. I was like, that's going to be a little tedious if I'm like solving puzzles with like this kind of weird mouse right trigger interaction. I, I was like, it kind of, again, it threw me off because the imagery that I saw on the steam page and the like title page looks like you're going to be playing like a classic, like pixel style. Like you move left, right, up, down, like along mm-hmm. a, a top down map. And I was like, I don't know how that works on a with the, the point and click uh, mechanic. But um, yeah, as soon as you log in, you kind of go through this like really like I thought pretty seamless tutorial for how to use the operating system mm-hmm. uh, and you boot up the game. It's like, oh, so in the game, you in the game on the operating system. I don't know how we I need to find a better yeah. way to clarify this. Um you you move around using like uh, normal like left joystick or left uh, directional arrows the way you would expect to move on a top yeah. down puzzle yeah. game, and so it was like I kept having this moment of like, oh I'm not sure I'm gonna like this. Oh, okay, oh I'm not sure I'm gonna like this. Oh, okay, and like honestly that was my vibe the entire first <laughs> section of this game where I was yeah. like, oh no, like there's so much to explore and like the way you move around this map. Uh, you could miss a ton of stuff. And every time that I had that concern, the developers had done something to resolve it. And mm-hmm. so I, I think as we get into it, we'll get into more of these moments. But I think like that feeling of relief just kept yeah. like coming in as I was playing through the game. Oh, that's super, super interesting. And I think one thing that I didn't even think about, but you have highlighted for me was this cuz cuz even in our description of like oh we're playing the game but not the game game the game <laughs> of the os of of the game you know it's like there's this interesting yeah. separation that the game immediately makes you really aware of that you are not you're not like in the game not, not in the way that traditional games want you to be immersed in the game it's like you are playing this but you are still separate from it mm-hmm. like 
And if you're playing on the Switch, it's almost this like two degrees of separation because you're playing on the Switch with an OS and then you play the game. <laughs> uh, so I think that's something that I wanted to highlight um, and we'll continue to delve into like what does it mean to be a player of one shot as we go in. So. Can I share, because you mentioned like feelings of paranoia. Yeah. Um, because of that degree of separation that they force you from the beginning to, to put yourself in like this... Um, almost like omniscient player character mm -hmm. role. Like you are almost a character in the game. Yeah. At least on Switch, they use your profile name when you're playing. And like yeah. the first time I saw Joel, J-O-W-L, which is my Switch yeah. <laughs> profile name, I, I was like, oh, oh, they, they, know, they know me. <laughs> they know I'm here. I, yeah. They're aware of my presence. And so like that feeling of paranoia, that like, something deeper is going on here about me as a player of maybe mm -hmm. games in generally, or at least this game is like, there's something deeper happening here than just like you're a cat boy solving problems. Yes, um, exactly. So again, like every time I was like, Oh man, am I just like walking around? No, you're not just walking around solving problems. Like you, there's something else happening here. Yeah. And as you open up the game itself, the actual one shot application, um, you, I think you just are, brought into a room with with this little cat person <laughs> not person i think there's a line later that nico this cat uh, nico. they're like yeah they're like i am human <laughs> but but then another character's like but you have cat ears and <laughs> nico's like well but cats walk on fours <laughs> yeah like, well okay sure <laughs> um so yeah nico's a cat like human i guess um but you're you're in just like an a bedroom which is kind of interesting everything's dark everything's dark there are holes in the floorboards mm -hmm. the doors are locked and joel was immediately stuck <laughs> <laughs> i think i was playing for about 10 minutes in this just opening very small room before i texted jenny and i was like i can't figure out what to do I've gone to the playthrough guide. It's not like the thing that it's telling me to do, I can't do. What is going on? And Jenny was kind enough to hop on the game, start playing through that opening <laughs> level and be like, okay, Joel, you have to do this, then this. And I, yeah, we, we got well, there, but. <laughs> no, I wouldn't, don't like depreciate yourself in that sense. Cause it's like, it is not an intuitive beginning. I think mm. out of everything in the game, the beginning is probably my one biggest piece of critique and feedback of like, if you have never played like an old point and click adventure where you are meant to combine and interact with everything and use an item as you interact with everything, mm. it is not intuitive. And there is no instruction given to you. You're literally just like, Nico wakes up and is like, I'm here. And that's all you're given. And so as this omniscient player, you very quickly feel not very omniscient because you're just like, I have no idea. Everything is locked. You pick up a remote control, but you're like, I don't know how to use it. And eventually it's like the most... I think I stumbled into it the first time. And even the second time when you texted me, because I was like, oh, I'm going to play the game later tonight, but I'll just boot it up now since you're in it and I'll do this first part. I even was like, what did I even do? There's nothing <laughs> intuitive here that feels right. And I stumbled into it again where I was like, I know the only item we have is this remote control. I'm just going to use it everywhere. And you use it at the window and it's like, oh, it's light enough by the window to read the controller. <laughs> I was so frustrated about it. So like <laughs> a couple of like side notes. One, the walkthrough guide I happen to be referencing uh, just tells you to walk out the door to the left. It doesn't tell you that you have to do this remote interaction until later on in the page. <laughs> so it's like, why did you tell me to walk out of the door to the left while it's still locked? And then later tell me how to like mm -hmm. unlock that door. But I will just say like, uh, we talked, I guess this is almost similar to the Undertale thing. It was like, what is the like logic behind the words that you choose? Mm -hmm. What is the logic behind the remote control and the window? Like that to me just made no sense. And like later on you find a TV and the remote has nothing to do with TV. So it's <laughs> like, I, it's like, okay, we're going to be playing a very esoteric 
puzzle game here and it is not always going to be obvious how the puzzle pieces fit together (laughs) yeah i think my biggest tip especially for the start of this game this first hour where you're getting out of the room you're working through the barons i think is the toughest hour because you're learning how the game thinks Mm. um once you've gotten into the habit of being like okay let me try just like using this item here because maybe this could work or learning where to pay attention to like what clues because there are always clues but if you don't know to pay attention or when to pay attention it'll just go over your head um and it's just because it is a very esoteric and older style of puzzle adventure gaming that uh is not super common anymore or at least the logic leaps that are being asked sometimes are not super common um that being said i think if you do pay attention to like what nico says and if you interact with everything there is always a dialogue box that provides some sort of hint however strong a hint may be your mileage (laughs) may vary but there's always a hint uh i've been like really trying to be be observant to that and i think the, the remote control is really the only one that's like it kind of comes out of nowhere (laughs) it just i think the thing that was so frustrating to me is like there's a bookcase and it's like it's too dark to read the books and it just would have made sense to me that you pull a book off of the bookcase and take the book to the window to lead read by moonlight (laughs) and then that's where the code for the computer is that lets you (laughs) unlock this door like what not on the remote control where you keep your passwords um i just didn't like so as you play through the rest of this opening section, I felt like there's almost a bit of dream logic happening with the the different items that you collect. Uh, Sorry, one second. My headphone just died, so I'm going to plug it in. All right, there we go. <laughs> no problem. It's it's good. <laughs> okay, should I go back to the last thing? Uh, yeah, if you could, just for myself. <laughs> no, sure. Um <clears throat> The thing that I noticed in this opening section is that you, for the most part, Mm -hmm. it's all, there's almost like a bit of dream logic where it's like, well, how is this light bulb a sun? How is this Mm -hmm. sponge collecting acid? Like there's just a bit of dream logic, but for the most part, it's dream logic that kind of makes sense in a fantastical way. Like you understand why combining these tools unlocks and helps solve a puzzle or like helps this robot solve their problem or whatever Mm -hmm. like it's there's like a certain kind of logic to it and so the fact that this opening sequence is just even now looking back it's so illogical to me is just like what happened here (laughs) why 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 this (laughs) yeah because once you once you get the first code everything kind of fall at least for me as a player yeah. everything sort of falls into place where you're like yep. okay got the code go to the next thing you pick up an item you start combining items to create this like blue fire um mm-hmm. and light your apartment mm-hmm. um and as you said as as nico explores this really sort of derelict apartment abandoned building um you go downstairs you pick up this light bulb um that glows as soon as Nico touches it and you can leave the building, which is like, okay, you, you don't know. And Nico doesn't really seem to know why they're there um, or anything. You just, you just kind of know you got to get out of this room. Uh, Yeah. yeah. Like like, it's what's strange to me is that the moments that do feel illogical like there's dream logic and there's like some things that are a little illogical mm-hmm. um it's like they're such easy fixes from like a writing perspective like i if you go once you get the light bulb you can go out the front door and it's like well, why does the light bulb unlock the front door like that doesn't make any sense like if however it had been you can't find the handle it's too dark and you can't find the handle Mm-hmm. And then you have a light bulb that illuminates the handle. Like, I don't know. It's like small things like that. Just like, I was like, what, what's going on here? Like it, this is obviously intentional. They did this on purpose. I'm so curious to see as we get into this, like, what is the, what is happening with these clues, with these items? Mm-hmm. I'm hoping that there's some like uh, payoff might be the word that I'm looking for, for like, mm-hmm. why are we engaging with the world in this particular way? Yeah. Um, 
And once once you head out, you start to get a little bit of sort of context for everything. Um, I I immediately headed down and I met the Prophet Bot, <clears throat> mm -hmm. which is your first. <laughs> I, I can't say friend because even the profit bot is like, I don't have the capacity for friends, <laughs> you know, and it's like, oh, okay, um, which is a really interesting thread to also talk about because these mm -hmm. robots are also, uh, as a whole, they talk about how they are programmed to do spe very specific things and only those things. Um, mm -hmm. But profit bots programming is to let the Messiah know about the prophecy. Uh, Nico because Nico holds the sun. Uh, this light bulb is the sun for the new world. Nico is the Messiah. And the prophecy is that um, I think it's something like an outsider from this world will come in, help restore the sun and save the world. Pretty big, pretty big um, <laughs> shoes to fill for this little, little cat. For a child. And yeah. I think one of the things that I loved is that like kind of midway through this opening section, you meet a robot that like explicitly is like, you should not be doing this. Like you yeah. are, you are too young. This is dangerous. Like yada, yada. And it's just like one of those things that I wish got said when you're reading like a YA book or whatever, where it's like yeah. the child is put in this extremely dangerous thing. Yeah. And it's just like, it's, it's kind of nice. Like you want it. What's the, there's a fra framework that's like you, you don't, have kids fight monsters to teach them the world is scary you have kids fight monsters you have kids see that they're fighting monsters to show that monsters can be defeated or something like that mm -hmm. and it's like i love that idea i love that theory i also wish at least sometimes in your like harry potter book or whatever there was the adult that's like hey it's completely unreasonable for you to do this <laughs> yeah yeah i I, I agree yeah. and and this is something that's highlighted quite often as you play because as you explore like there's a machine that's like crushing you know it's got crushing powers uh, in the sense that it's like constantly flattening objects and mm -hmm. nico even says like "Ooh, I, i'm kind of scared like i don't want to be close to this machine i don't want to get caught in it um which you know anyone would probably say it but this mm -hmm. was a very like child like I saw this and I was like, oh my gosh, yeah, a kid shouldn't be around this kind of machinery. Um, like you said, this the robot Silver was talking about how this is a child and why is a child doing the world saving work? Um, and even later on in the Barrens, when you're going through the dormitory section uh, and Nico's like, I don't like ladders. I'm scared of ladders. And Nico won't climb the ladders because they're scared. <laughs> so yeah. I think there's a lot of... Um, there's a lot of attention placed on the fact that Nico is a child. Nico also asks for their mom or like talks about how they want to just go home and see their mom. And I'm just like, I want you to go home and see your mom too. I don't want you to have to do this. Like, I don't even yeah. know what this is, but I want you to go home to your mom. <laughs> yeah. Well, and it's so interesting. So like, um, since you, you brought up silver, this, uh, robot that has been tamed and mm -hmm. what we learned, this word tamed is like, capital letters like it's an important word and like yeah. these are robots that are not so far as far as i understand it yeah um there are robots that only do the thing that they are purpose built to do and then there are robots that it sounds like can do other things and can think for themselves a bit more mm -hmm. and perhaps those as far as i can understand it i is my first time playing yeah. uh those are what tamed robots can do is they have that ability yeah, it's interesting. At some point, you actually see uh, Isaac Asimov's three rules of yes. uh, robots or ro robot living. I can't remember what the, the framework is, but like, don't harm humans. Mm -hmm. uh, like, don't let them harm, harm themselves, like whatever uh, the three rules themselves are. I can't remember at this point, but like, I thought the idea that we are drawing this distinction between tamed and untamed robots mm -hmm. and you mentioned this as a theme at the beginning this idea of consciousness and what does that really mean oh, I, I, they are immediately introducing that idea and i'm so eager to see how it goes mm -hmm. the fact that when silver says this thing about like you shouldn't be doing this coming back to the idea of like acceptance um right. she she's like we we are we should just let this world kind of do what it's going to do and right um, allow that to happen yeah oh you have like two two big things um okay re-taming 
Um, I think you're absolutely right. Taming is like the word that we really, and the concept we really want to pay attention to as we play. I think it's really interesting um, to note how tamed uh, when they, when you read about the evacuations, because this is a this is a world um, you can very quickly find a map in one of the factory areas, and it's like mm-hmm. the barrens are the outer ring of this world. There's like a green glen area that's sort of the center, and then it like leads up to the city into the tower, which is like your goal for restoring the sun. Um, the barrens are barren because everyone's evacuated towards the center, and so Silver does say the tamed robots along with like the other people were the ones evacuated so it's like Mm. they're considered more important or significant for whatever reason as well um which i think is kind of interesting like you don't it almost goes back to when we were talking about um the book i was reading the ocean one um and how i was like you don't name fish right? Like you don't name random fish (laughs) in the sea, but you have like, like we'll name dolphins and otters. And so it's like, you start to see this distinction of like, what do you consider worthwhile to bring with you and to save versus what is perhaps not. Um, And again, it goes back to this idea of being tamed. Um, We, we do know, Oh yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, I I was going to ask you, um, Mm You've obviously played the game, so mm-hmm. I you might have like an unfair advantage with this question. But one of the things that's so interesting to me is that they chose to use the word tamed mm-hmm. because usually when you think of something that's been tamed, it's kind of like under your control, right? Mm-hmm. Or under control in some way. Mm-hmm. And it is strange to me that the robots who only do one thing, they do their purpose, whatever that happens to their their program, whatever that happens to be they are they are untamed it mm-hmm. is strange to me that the robots that seem to have more free will for maybe lack of a better word are the ones that are considered tamed and i was wondering if you had any kind of first thought insights into why they might use that word uh if it means this more like free will type creature yeah i to be honest we i played it a couple years ago so my memory is quite fuzzy on yeah. a lot of this so in go in playing through this with everyone i'm also like rediscovering a lot of this um i don't have an answer for that specific question but i have a reference that i was actually going to try and find either online or like at a library um the story of the velveteen rabbit mm. um because i vaguely remember there is like there's this element of the velvet. I don't want to spoil it for anyone who maybe hasn't read the Velveteen Rabbit. It's a children's book about this stuffed rabbit um, and the boy who like loves this stuffed animal. And I think in re- I need to reread that story, but I think in rereading that story, we may perhaps get closer to an idea of what tamed may be, even though they Ooh. don't use the word tamed in that story interesting spoilers for a book that's a hundred years old is it a hundred years old it's pretty old oh, my god gosh, it wow. is a sad sad story so i yeah i'll have to go back and read through it too that's it's, it's been a long time <laughs> yeah i cannot i it just and again this is me kind of just like thinking out loud as we talk um because for some reason, when I was thinking about being tamed and the game and sort of what some of the things they allude to, and yes, a little bit of like what I kind of remember of the game, the Velveteen Rabbit did pop up. And I don't know if it's a one-to-one, like it is a good example or a good reference, but hmm. I know it came up and I want to explore that further. Okay, so I here's my theory um, on tamed, the, un, the mm-hmm. untamed. Um, so I pulled up the Asimov's three robot rules. One, a robot may not injure a human being or through inaction allow a human being to come to harm. Mm-hmm. Two, a robot must obey the orders given to it by human beings, except where such orders would conflict with the first law. Three, a robot must protect its own existence as long as such protection does not conflict with the first or second law. I My theory is to be tamed is to be trusted to follow these three laws even if you are not doing the thing that you were explicitly programmed for like mm-hmm. you are tame if you can follow these three rules on your it, while you have free will 
quote free will. Um, so to me, like that's that's the best theory I have right now as a as a, a green player hopping in here is like maybe there's something to do with like robots that can be trusted to follow these rules are considered tame robots. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, I'm excited. I I think as we play, we're definitely going to get more examples of tame versus not tame. So I do know it's like for sure we know untamed robots follow programming to the T. They are more sort of straightforward, seems to be simplistic in the sense that they have like a direct task and a direct output. I think it's interesting because Silver mentions that, that they played like chess with another robot who was tamed i think uh and so this ability like you said to also think freely to Mm -hmm. think outside of the box and puzzle solve is an element of being tamed um but it's one of those things where it's like is it a symptom or a cause like do you become tame because you can do those things or do you do those things because something's happened to make you tamed it's a sense. classic are you gojo satoru because you're the strongest or are you the strongest because you're gojo satoru exactly Shout out to my jjk fans yeah. <laughs> exactly <laughs> um and i think this is one of the more interesting questions that we'll dive into for sure uh throughout this game it's like what does it mean to be tamed because it's mm. gonna be it, this is a full game question for sure okay 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 yeah um, I think the other one that you were going to talk about was re the acceptance angle or something. Yeah, like those kind lines. of. I think there's this, you mentioned acceptance of like the end, I guess mm-hmm. is kind of one way to put yeah. it. And the reflection question that I wanted to put into the newsletter to post to all of you, of course, respond to anything you would like, but the reflection question in the newsletter will be, um, and I'm curious what you say, what... What do you do if you know your actions may not make a difference? <laughs> like this Nico, when talking to Silver, has this light bulb of the sun. And I think Silver or one of the other robots said something along the lines of like, I mean, I guess you could go do it, but the world's going to end anyways. Like, I guess go ahead. But it's not going to change the the final product. Um, and I'm curious in the face of that, like what what would you do? Man, um, I'm going to nitpick your wording because mm-hmm. I think there's a difference between it might not have any impact and it will not have any impact. Mm-hmm. And for me, if there's a might, then I I feel like I would go for it. I would, I would do my best to try and help. Mm-hmm. Uh, if it's a will, if there's like, n- there's just no way to change what is happening here. Yeah, I actually think acceptance is maybe like a more virtuous thing to do, like learning how to Mm. uh, come to grips with your current environment and surroundings, accept that this is likely the consequence of some action. Maybe you are responsible for, maybe you weren't. Mm. Um, I think that that there's a there's an element of like acknowledging truth to me is a higher order of being than living in a delusion. And Mm -hmm. if you are trying to like change something that you cannot or will not be able to change, there's like some delusional thinking in that, that like, Mm. especially coming up with like a lot of religious trauma (laughs) is something that like I would, I can't, I can't abide. Like I need it to, I need to live in the, the reality of my world as much as I can. Yeah. Ooh, that's, it's a tough, tough question. And it's one where the nitpicking that I did is around the phrase of like make a difference or impact Mm -hmm. because it's like, if you don't change the end result, can you still make some sort of positive impact, for example? Yeah. And that's where I started getting a little bit stuck on and talked myself into a few circles because if the world is going to end regardless, but perhaps in the meantime, um, you know, we can do an action that makes people at least a little bit lighter or more hopeful before the end of it. 
Is that is that helping them or in making a positive impact? Is it diluting them um, and allowing mm-hmm. them to not face the truth? And I kind of went back and forth between the two um, because part of me thinks like, you know, while we're here, we should take every chance we can to like do something that could potentially help someone else. But it's like what? But then it's like, what is the definition of helping? Like at that point. <laughs> Well, yeah, but I think you've put you've put your finger on it exactly. Like, let's say that y- y- we know. Let's say that it's a guaranteed certainty that yeah. Nico carrying this bulb to the top of the tower will not avert the end of this world. That it will mm-hmm. still end. Um, however, if as the as Nico travels through communities and they see him carrying this bulb, it gives them a glimmer of hope or a reason to feel positive. Um, Even if they know that it's not going to work, like just seeing someone try, try their best to like make their best of a bad situation, Mm -hmm. that positive impact. I think I I would count that like that is that to that, that word impact really matters. And I think that you've, Mm -hmm. you've totally nailed like the, the paradox of this is like, if you're in a vacuum and what you do isn't going to matter, accept it and move on. If you're living in a world in a community and society and like your actions are going to positively impact other people's lives, Mm -hmm. even if it's for a shorter period of time, I think that's great. Like, yeah, yeah, that's do something. (laughs) Yeah. Well, it's I think like one topic because it's very pertinent and relevant right now to us recording this in 2024 um, is I think about especially what's happening in Palestine and Mm -hmm. Uh, especially a couple about a week or two ago there was a lot of news that tended that ended up being incorrect where it was like palestine is totally cleansed and that was not true um and what was really interesting is seeing some of the folks responding to that saying um no matter like even if that were to be the case, we still need to speak up. We still need to say something. We still need to push yep. forward and fight. And as, as I was playing this and thinking about Nico at the end of this world, that's like basically is it's, it's not quite over, but everyone says it's over. It's like, what is the value of continuing to push when there's maybe this slight chance, maybe not, we don't know. And so that's something that my mind kept coming back to is like, when, when hope seems futile, when it seems like the apocalypse is here and that it's the end, is it really the end? Um, does it matter if we keep fighting until the end? And I, I came away with it with a yes. Hmm. But yeah, I think it's it's a tougher question. Well, I think actually you, you, we even get to encounter this in, um, in this section of the game because mm-hmm. you can play a game of chess with uh, Silver, the robot. Right. And she talks about how it's like really nice that he's playing with her and like he has, she hasn't gotten to play in a long time. And like, even if Silver is kind of the the epitome of the world's ending, mm-hmm. it, you shouldn't be here. Like we need to accept it. And yet she's able to have this positive experience and interaction because of Nico's willingness to to participate and live in community with her for a few moments mm-hmm. um so yeah I, I i definitely think that's real i think you've like really nailed it there like the the idea of like how do you if you can have an impact even if it doesn't change the outcome mm-hmm. uh it's worth it's worth it yeah yeah but i do think what what you said i really connect with in the sense of um knowing like there there has to be and there is a point in which i think you need to realize when you need for yourself to stop. Mm. Um, I think you mentioned or used the phrase of like seeing the truth uh, for what it is. And so I think that's what I keep kind of coming back to and trying to identify what does that look like, I guess. And I think that becomes a more personal question. And like you said, it depends on like, what is the context? Who are the communities and people impacted? Um, Mm -hmm. But I think that for me is maybe the hardest element of like, I know there is a point in which I believe folks should stop, you know, for the, for themselves as well as for other people. But I I don't know what it looks like. (laughs) I can't think of an example, really. There was an interview, I want to say it was with like, Ricky Gervais and Steve Colbert or something like that. 
um, where they talk about this idea of is it better to cling to a belief that you know is not factually true um, if that belief gives you comfort? And um, the perspectives of these two, and it, it might not have been these two, but I'm, I'm thinking it was, is that Ricky Gervais is kind of saying like, no, like we should always seek to kind of live in the truth if it can be identified. And if you are clinging to a lie that you know is a lie, because it gives you comfort that can lead to kind of like a destructive path that like it, it conflicts with how our world around us, it lives. It can be destructive to you. It can be destructive to your community. And it was just like, I think I'm very much in that bucket. Um, I don't like Ricky Gervais just to be very clear. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but like this perspective, this kind of philosophical perspective is something that I really resonate with mm -hmm. of like, you know, it's important to offer comfort, uh, for ourselves and others, but I think we should be striving that we can find comfort in truth instead of finding comfort in lies. I don't know any other way to say it than that. Mm -hmm. So it's just something that I, I, I definitely personally really resonate with. And I'm glad you brought this up because I, it's not something you get to talk about very often. No. And again, and <laughs> like we could probably, cause this is one of those things I'm sure in like philosophy class or something, they, they probably dive in way deeper, but <laughs> I'm like, well, but how do you know the truth, <laughs> you know, it's like, and, and then there's this certain point of, um, yeah, like depending, cause I, I also don't like Ricky Gervais and I'm pretty sure what he would consider some truths, I would not consider some truths. So it's, it's, I think, again, this is why this is a discussion and not like definitive answers. It's just, yeah. this is kind of what this conversation is getting to is I'm like, okay, well, if we're if we're doing that, then <clears throat> excuse me. How do we how do we identify our truths? And yeah, I don't know. <laughs> well, actually, I do know because mm -hmm. the game tells us how. Um, <laughs> because the game tells us. Thank goodness that, for one shot. <laughs> yeah, one shot tells us that actually we are God. <laughs> That's true. That is a definitive statement in the game. <laughs> As we are the god of this world. Yes. And we haven't really talked about, like, this is kind of a weird episode because we've been, like, so into the philosophy of the game. We yeah. haven't talked much about, like, mechanics and experiences. But that's fine. It's book club, baby. Yeah. Um, but it's so interesting because, like, at certain points, the game starts acknowledging you, the player of the yes. operating system that is running this game. And uh, Nico starts kind of talking with you, almost like praying to you uh, for yeah. guidance at certain points. And there are things that like Nico can can uh, be near in the world, but can't experience. And so you as the like omniscient player have to uh, click on it using the operating system mouse instead of Nico's yes. character to like read this <clears throat> thing or find this wallpaper or whatever. And it's this, I think, is one of the elements of the game that I am most excited to explore is what commentary is being made about the player of these games. Yes. Uh, like, you know, we just had this long conversation about like, is it worth persevering when you know something like it might not have like a positive impact in the end? That is a question that Nico can't answer because you control Nico. Mm -hmm. You make the decision about whether or not they're going to be moving forward, even though yeah. it's going to be futile. So this God element of all of this, this like you are a player in this game, my God, I am excited to see how they, how they move forward. Uh, yeah. With this. I totally agree. And that's why I think it's really important to think about these questions of like, would you, what would you do? Because in this game, this is not a hypothetical. This is a, you are you are going to be making this call for Nico of like, hey, you're gonna con you know by by playing this game, you are making the call that Nico needs to do this because it's worth trying to mm -hmm. save the world. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And the implications of that we don't know completely. Um, we'll discover as we play. But I agree. I think this is where the game gets super super interesting for me. Uh, is just as a player, what do you do and how do you interact with Nico, knowing that you control them. Um, I'm curious because you have dialogue options. Whenever Nico like prays to you or like, you know, tries to talk to you, oftentimes there's usually like a kinder type of response or like maybe a more abrupt or less 
uh, overtly kind response. I'm curious, did you go a certain way? <laughs> I am a I'm a kind and generous god <laughs> in this game. Um, I will say there was a point where uh, you can ask Nico to talk like a robot, and I did have him, I did ask him to talk like a robot. <laughs> And if you do that, he's like, bleep, blorp, I'm a robot. And um, another robot happens to be in the room that you didn't know was there. And they're like, we don't talk like that. (laughs) That was just like the funniest interaction. It is. But then, and Nico also is like, oh, you made me look silly. (laughs) And I'm just like, like oh my gosh. Well, but I loved it because I was laughing because I was like, this is really funny. And then when Nico was like, I actually feel kind of silly about this. I was like, oh. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. And it was. Can I kind of, offer comfort? I know. And I think it's incredible because at this point, you've known Nico for what, 30, 40 minutes? Mm-hmm. And I know I was already feeling very protective over this little cat person. Mm-hmm. <laughs> um, and even though it's like, again, fictional character, but I'm just like, oh, I didn't mean to make you feel bad. Um, so I thought that was that was a really interesting little moment as well. Um, yeah, absolutely. As far as the game goes, though, I think... Oh, did you have another no, point? No, no, please. Okay. I was going to say, as far as the game goes in terms of, like, this this area and sort of the goal um, and the mechanic, you know, you're, you're wandering around, you're trying to figure out how to activate uh, and get your way closer to the tower. And so eventually in your wandering, you find this... It's a robot. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. no, ro- R-O-W bot. So it's bot. like an actual ro... <laughs> like a ship bot um and your main goal in this area is to just fix this robot up uh so that you can progress to the next area um you do that by just gathering items combining them putting them together as you go through all of these sort of conversations um and it's a pretty straightforward task to be very honest like the game itself doesn't give you a ton to be like mechanically uh i guess deep with Mm -hmm. i found so yeah and yet uh they have done some things to make it delightful Mm -hmm. along the way because you're like it's like oh you have a stick you have a a a rod you happen to find a machine that crushes the rod and turn it into a crowbar now you can open a box inside the box is a battery the battery's Mm -hmm. dead you go find this like it's that kind of like uh experience in the game so like um very almost like connect the dots in a way yes. like you have to connect these dots to move forward and see the picture they have done some things to make it um really delightful for me mm-hmm. uh, at least one the little dash button that lets you move quickly feels so good like at first before i found the dash button i was like oh man am i gonna be walking around a huge map i have to go this so slow <laughs> and the, the dash button is like oh this is actually like the perfect pace is exactly how fast I'd like to be moving. Mm-hmm. And every time you take a, a step it, and it changes in every environment, you hear the little like, and it's, I don't know why, but like, it just tickles my brain in that right place that it's like, oh yes. Like, oh, you're in the factory. And so your, your footsteps are going to echo while you're in here or you're in the grass. So it makes a crunchy sound. Like it just felt so good to play it. And you get fast travel, which obviously like is going to make it easier as you're running around trying to collect these things. But the thing they did to actually like make me not miserable because we've talked before that like fetch quest type games really bother me. Mm-hmm. Um, they organized the world in such a way that you don't actually have to backtrack a lot. Like it for it's like oh you're in the bottom you're in the southern portion of the map and there's one building there you should go in because when you move to the next portion you can see i'm in the next portion Mm -hmm. i didn't explore that thing in the last portion because like i'm the kind of person's like oh there's a trail to the left maybe there's a korok there that i can like find and there are no koroks in this game which is fine uh a little disappointing uh but no i think the the way they organize the map tell it communicates to you the player where you need to go in and it's not like endless exploration to find the things that you need like in Mm -hmm. general the stuff is all pretty readily available so i I thought just the way they organize the map and the layout uh, it's like the perfect amount of freedom to move around Mm -hmm. without making it like overwhelming and like impossible to find the one item that you need to move forward 
Yeah. Yeah, I totally agree. Um, I think I was most interested to see how you would interpret or feel (laughs) about this because I knew that this game was very like fetch questy in the sense of like you're constantly just looking for another item to do another item to do a thing with another item. And so I was like, oh, well, hopefully the the story carries it for Joel if the (laughs) if the mechanics don't pan out um, for him. But yeah, I'm glad it looks like and it seems like you are enjoying that so far. Yes. And it's like hats off to the the creators of the game that like they were able to construct their maps and experiences in a way that's like just wide enough that you want to like explore around Mm -hmm. and just confined enough that it's not miserable and overwhelming. Like I feel like that's a hard balance to strike. And at least in the Barrens, I thought that they they did a really good job. Yeah. Awesome. Well, I think that is, that is all I had for this section, unless there was something that you want to talk about that we missed. Um. I think, yeah, that's pretty much it. So if you would like to share your thoughts on one shot, whether or not it's based on, you know, something explicit we've discussed, or if there's something that we missed that you're like, nope, I need to get y'all on this fast, uh, please do send any questions or comments to either Jenny at geeksandgrounds.com or again, we have our cool new voicemail option. Uh, you hey. could leave a voicemail at sayhi.chat slash geeks and grounds. Um, yeah, that's it for this week's episode. Thanks again Thank for listening. Thank you so much for joining us. It's a pleasure as always to get to chat with you all and hear your thoughts on these games. We play through them every month. Uh, if you find yourself believing the world is coming to an end, just take one shot of espresso and pick yourself up and try and do something about it. <laughs> <laughs> Bye, Bye, everyone. The Geeks and Ground podcast is produced and edited by me, Jenny Windham. The logo is designed by Lee Thomas, and the intro-outro song is a sample from the one-shot OST, the track titled The Prophecy. In addition to episodes across YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts, you can find us on Instagram and Blue Sky at Geeks and Grounds. Visit geeksandgrounds.com for direct links to our Discord community, newsletter sign up, and email questions, thoughts, comments, or feedback to Jenny at jenny at geeksandgrounds.com. Thanks again.